Amen. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Happy new month. Happy month of May. It's already the fifth month of the year. And just the same way the Lord has been keeping us all these years, He is keeping us through the year. All glory to the King of Kings. Amen. All right. So in the next few minutes, we will go into our, uh, our, our Sunday school lesson for today. I know everyone does, may not have a manual, so those who have, if you don't mind sharing with those who do not have, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Amen. All right, so we are all up uh, over to lesson five now, um, but just a quick, uh, a quick recap of lesson four that we were studying last week. So last week we were looking at lesson four and the title of that outline, um, it said, it is by the mercies of God. It is by his mercy. And we can see that that statement, you know, we say it is by his mercies or it is by God's mercies, right? And uh, I believe we read from, let me just pick up the text real quick. We read from the book of Psalms, uh, Psalms 89, verse 1 to 8. You know, and we know it is by his mercies that we are not consumed and, and all that stuff. But we examined we examined the the just that title of the lesson, it is by his mercies, and we said, Well, this statement that we all make and say it is by his mercies, is it a true statement? Right? And we didn't do a lot of teaching, but rather we engaged and we talked with one another and we we discovered that we had proofs, we had tangible proofs, you know, to validate that statement. That yes, indeed, it is by God's mercies. And we all shared, you know, people shared uh, instances and examples of how, you know, God delivered them from sickness. God delivered them from, from, from accidents. You know, God came in in the last minute to rescue us from different challenges and situations. And we got to see that indeed, of a truth, it is by the mercies of God. Everything in our lives, anything in our lives, it is by the mercies of God. And then we had takeaways. The takeaway was to not be silent about that. The fact that, yes, indeed, it is by God's message that you are who you are, you are where you are, you have what you have, the capacities that you have, it is by his mercies. You ought to thank him for it. You ought to be grateful for it. And you ought to share that with other people. Every opportunity you get, you must acknowledge God in your life, in your family, in your situations. We ought to acknowledge God. Amen. So, I hope uh, during the course of the last week, you were continuing to experience that mercy and you were continuing to acknowledge God's mercies over your life. Amen. All right, so that's, uh, that was last week. So today, uh, lesson number five, and the title of this lesson, uh, it's, uh, it's titled Relentless soul winning relentless soul winning relentless soul winning we know that soul winning uh as believers it is one of the key pillars of our faith it is one of the key pillars um of of our faith of our devotion of our walk with god soul winning jesus won my soul i ought to win a soul the same way he rescued me I ought to be a tool in the hands of God to, to rescue the next person who is yet to receive the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So this is the focus of our lesson today, relentless soul winning. Well, let's read through our text, and then we'll, we'll have a conversation uh, to take, you know, with some takeaways today uh, as well. Our text today is from the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 30, 33. Verse 7 to 11. Ezekiel, it's in the Old Testament, chapter 33, verse 7 to 11. And if someone would help us read, please. Ezekiel, chapter 33. Ezekiel, chapter 33, verse 7 to 11. Have said thee a watchman 
unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word of my mouth at my, at my mouth, and warn them for me. The state, when I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. He that does not speak to warn the wicked from his ways, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity for his blood which I require of thy hands. The, nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his ways to turn from it, if he do not turn from his, from his way, he shall, he shall die in his iniquity, for thou hast delivered, it, hast delivered thy soul. Verse 10, therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, If our, trans if our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we, and we pine away in them, how, would, how, should, how should we then live? And in verse 7, say unto them, As I live, said the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of, of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his ways and live, that ye turn ye from your evil ways. For die, for, die, for why will ye die, O son of Israel? Those were the words of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, sir. Then our memory verse is that last verse, Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. That is our memory verse, Ezekiel 33, verse 11. So let's read it together. One, two, go. Say unto them, as I leave, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and leave. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Once again, say unto them, as I leave, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and leave. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Amen. All right, so just taking it off from there, very clearly to even start with, we already see what gives God pleasure and what doesn't give God pleasure, right? What does not give God pleasure is the death of the wicked. Is that someone dies being a wicked person. Is that someone dies being a sinner. No pleasure for God in that. And if you are of God, if I am of God, whatever God finds no pleasure in, I should also not find pleasure in that. But then I really got to ask myself, is it true for me that I really do not find pleasure in the, in the death of a sinner? I gotta ask myself that question now. Ezekiel 33, 11, very plainly said, my God, my father, does not have any pleasure in the death of a sinful person. When the person dies still being a sinner, when the person dies without having accepted Jesus, God has no pleasure in that. My father has no pleasure in that. You see, this is my father here. There are things that my father doesn't like, right? If I end up liking what my father doesn't like, what do you think will happen? There will be commotion, right? If I end up being okay with what my father is not okay with, we're going to have some issues. So for us as believers, if our God, our father in heaven, does not find pleasure in the death of a sinner, and then I am, you know, disregarding of the death of a sinner, well, I don't really care about it. It doesn't bother me. That's a problem. That's a big issue. Very big issue. So that's the first thing to just consider in your heart silently this morning. Do I really care? And people die all the time. People are dying per second in this world. Do I ever think of that? That somebody may have just passed away this past second, and they didn't know Christ? Am I bothered by that? Does it mean anything to me? Does it concern me? I got to ask myself these questions as a believer and be honest with myself. Okay? You got to be honest with yourself. Scripture tells us that, you know, we should not, in, all, in, in paraphrasing, not overestimate, you know, to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. If the truth, when I ask myself that question, is that, yeah, maybe I'm not, I haven't really been as concerned 
about the unsaved, it's okay to come to that realization. It's okay to tell yourself the truth if that's indeed the case. But what we are going to start, what we're starting this morning is to say, okay, well, now that my eyes are open, now that I realize that I'm at variance with my Father in heaven, what do I do about it? God said to Ezekiel, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I have no pleasure. Sometimes you really have to take a, you know, slow down a bit and, and really understand certain words in Scripture. See, when God is saying, I have no pleasure, it's not just a passing phrase to say, I have no pleasure. It's, how can I describe it? Is it's like this causes him extreme unhappiness. So when we say no pleasure, it doesn't mean just ah, okay, God has no pleasure. Think about what that what that's saying. It's extreme unhappiness. Extreme, and I know you know when we talk about God, we can be defining God in terms of happiness, but it's extreme sadness, extreme anguish. I don't know what other adjectives I can use to describe it. But it's not just a basic, you know, there, there, God has no pleasure in the dead of a wicked. It is extremely emotional for your father, your God, our God, when a sinner dies without having accepted Jesus. And I think I said it some time ago here, we have to be able to connect to the emotion behind God's reaching out to the lost. If you do not see God's emotion towards the lost, you're not going to care about it. God finds no pleasure. There is no joy for God when a sinner dies without being saved. I'm emphasizing this this morning because all of us, myself included, as the body of Christ, we need to carry this same passion in our hearts. The way God feels about it, I must feel that way. I have to feel that same way about the unsaved. You know, in our world today, it's about being progressive, being liberal, and all this, all this other stuff. God is not progressive. God is not liberal. God is God. And, and we know what he likes, and we know what he hates, and he's God. He remained the same. He does not bend to the will of man. He created man. You know, he's defined parameters for us to live. He has defined parameters for, for, for man to be redeemed, to have eternal life, to keep it eternal life, to be sustained in eternal life. He has defined parameters for this thing. And guess what? He's not changing. He's not becoming the progressive or liberal or whatever else you want to talk about. I know the world that we live in today makes it a whole lot harder for us to be like God and not find pleasure and be anguished and be distraught when we see a person living in sin. Because of the world we live in today, it's so, yeah, we all just, let's just take it like that. It's the way the world is. So we, 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 we don't really, you know, sometimes we, we tend not to care anymore. Because the word is just uh, going farther and farther and farther away from the truth of God's word. So God finds no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I have to check myself. And if I don't have that same feeling of anguish and dismay, that there are people in this world who their end, because of their current choices and decisions, who their end is eternal separation from God. If I don't find this pleasure in that, I, I need to ask the Holy Spirit for help. To help me empathize with the lost. I have to. Reading Father, Ezekiel 33 verse 11. What gives God pleasure then? So if we know that the death of a wicked does not give God pleasure, what gives God pleasure? 
It says, but that the wicked turn from his way and leave. That the wicked turn from his way and leave. That is what gives God pleasure. That the wicked turns from his way and leaves. That the wicked turns from the way that leads to death and turns to the redemption that is in Jesus. That is what gives God pleasure. In the book of Luke, it says, there is great joy in heaven over one, you know, paraphrasing, over one redeemed person, over one person that comes back to the Father, over one soul that comes back to the kingdom of God. There is great joy in heaven. There is great joy in, with God. There is great joy in God's presence. When one person, one person, not a hundred people, one person turns back to God. So what gives God pleasure? But that the wicked turn from his way and turns to life. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die? O house of Israel. Um, I want to read something. I want us to read something. Uh, I think it's uh, 1 Corinthians. Romans 10. Give me a minute to find this. We'll come to this later, but consider if I know now that what gives God pleasure is that the wicked, the sinful, are able to turn back around and turn to life, the question then becomes how or what or when will the wicked, will the sinful, be able to turn back around to God and turn to life. What makes that happen? That's where you and I come in. This thing that gives God pleasure, this thing that gives God pleasure, how does it come about? That's where we all come into the picture. That's where we all come into the question. For the wicked to be able to turn around and turn back to life, that's where we step in. So that's the focus of our, of our lesson this morning. Relentless soul winning. Relentless soul winning. And you see the, the word relentless, it suggests something, right? It suggests that we, there's already an action. And now you are being asked not to relent. But if there's no action, <laughs> if there's no action at all, we can't even be talking about relentless. So maybe we should just start from soul winning 101 before we start talking about relentless. Amen. Amen. Let me say a few, a few more things about you know, soul winning. One, like I've already said, you need to carry that, the same emotion that God carries for, for the sinners in your heart. That's... There's no soul winning if you don't feel what God feels for the lost. If you don't feel it, what God feels for the lost, forget it. We can, I can stand here and talk for eight hours about soul winning. If you don't carry the emotion, if you don't feel God's anguish, if you don't feel it, if you don't carry that care, we're not even going to go anywhere. So I want us to actually pause here and, and just bow, bow your heads. Let's, let's say a word of prayer to God. Let's ask God for, for the grace to be able to carry concern for the lost. Please bow your heads and let's say that word of prayer. Father, give me a heart, a heart of concern for the lost. Give me a heart of concern for the unsaved. Give me a heart of, of deep empathy. For the lost, for those who do not have your light in their life, those who have not accepted the redemption that is in Jesus, the freedom, the liberty that is in Christ, give me passion for these souls. 
by the help of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's talk about a little bit about our situation. I've noticed something. You know, in especially in this part of the world. There's a certain culture where in this country where everyone just minds their business, right? Everyone just minds their business. So if I'm going to Walmart, I just mind my business. I just go to Walmart, get what I need, get in my car and go home. Right? When I, I live in an apartment today, when I get back home, I just get out of my car, get my stuff, walk into my door, boom, that's it. Um, when I'm going home, I drive down my street, I open my garage, I park my car in, vim, and that's it. <laughs> if, we, if we settle in that kind of culture where, let me just mind my business, there's not going to be any soul winning. Look at Jesus while he was on the earth. Look at the apostles while they were on the earth. They were not minding their business, though. They were not. They were engaging with people. And I know we've told ourselves all these things that are, ah, you know, you don't want to approach a person. You don't want to talk to a person. So we just carry our face straight faced, you know, with no smile and no joy. And we just mind our business. That's not how we're going to win souls. Jesus was engaging with people. He was finding common ground. The apostles were doing the same. You know, we read in the book of uh, in the book of Acts, when Paul, you know, he traveled down to Athens and then he was by the, the riverside and he saw some people doing something or just hanging around. And then he approached them and asked them a question. And from that question that he asked them, it progressed to those people being baptized in a few minutes after the conversation. We got to pull out of that culture that says, just mind your business. And then we come to church. It's not in church that we, yes, by the grace of God, people come into church who are unsaved and they hear the word and they get redeemed. But there's, in, in parentheses, there's very little opportunity for soul winning in the building here. It's when you and I are out and about in the city. That's where we have opportunities to save souls. But if, if while we are out there, we are silent, we are straight-faced, we don't engage, we don't, we don't find common ground, People that are around us, we are losing a great opportunity for soul winning. You and I are the ones that will bring about pleasure for God. You and I are the ones that will bring about redemption of souls. We are the tools in God's hands. We are the vessels unto honor. But we don't function by not engaging. If you actually have a heart to engage, then guess what? You begin to see the opportunities. Part of the reason why we don't actually get opportunities to engage with people that would lead to us sharing the word of God with them is because we, we don't even, we're not looking for the opportunities. Let me put it that way. We just want to go to work, do our task, and go home. Get to the store, get in and get out. Don't talk to anybody, don't smile to anybody, don't engage with anybody. That's not, the life, that's, not the, that's not this Christian life. That's not the life of Christ. That's not the example of Christ. That's not the example of the apostles. We have to be engaging. So please, if you feel conditioned to how things are, you know, in this, in this part of the world, you know, we, we've also accepted, right, that, oh, you can't go knocking at somebody's door, they will, they will bring a gun out and shoot you. Do you know that the latter-day saints supposed to go to people's house and knock? They're not being shot. Let's not accept these cultural things that are not necessarily factual. And we put a barrier for ourselves in doing this work. People still go to people's house and knock. Did you ever witness people still do that? Nobody's shooting them. So let's not put these cultural barriers and say, oh, this is the way it is. And then not do what God requires us to do. Relentless soul winning is what we are talking about today. Amen. So, from the few things we've said so far, we know what gives God pleasure. 
We know what doesn't give God pleasure. We know that we need to carry the same passions in us. We know that in order to do the work, we need to pull out from this culture of mind your business. We have to be engaging. Say hello to your neighbor. Ask for your, what's your, ask for your neighbor's name. Find common ground. There is always common ground. There is always something that if me and Pastor Mrs. spend a few minutes talking about today, we will find something that we both have common ground in. It is not possible that I don't have anything <laughs> common with anybody. There's always common ground. And that's your, that's your stake of point. That's your take-off point. Relentless soul winning. This is not, this is a, this is, soul winning is a key pillar. It's a key pillar of this life, this Christian life. If that pillar is not solid and standing, our Christian life is going to be shaky. In the book of Hebrews, Scripture talks about the fact that, you know, there is great, there's, there's, there's a reward for those who win souls, right? And I think I've shared this here before. Imagine what, anyone who wins souls is a laborer for God, right? Anyone who engages in soul winning, you are a laborer for God. In other words, you are enrolled into God's payroll. So God takes care of you when you win souls. Because you are a laborer in his vineyard. So as a key pillar of your Christian life, I would be making my pillar weak. One of the pillars that makes me stand as a believer. I would be making that pillar weak and making my foundation shaky. And making my, bu my building probably crumble if I'm not invested in soul winning. I want us to really capture how critically important soul winning is to our Christian life. Soul winning to the Christian is not just another thing. It is a core thing. It is a core element of this life. It's not just another thing that we just should talk about once in a while. No, it is a core pillar of our life. It is a core cornerstone of the foundation of this life. And if I'm not fully invested in doing this, I may be making my life a bit shaky. I may be making my foundations a bit shaky. Amen. All right, as we wrap this up, relentless soul winning. We have to start first before we, we talk about not relenting. Let's just run through a few quick... Uh, so when you, when you... We've actually prayed today and we've said the Lord give us that passion and gives us that heart to have care and concern and reach out to the lost and the unsaved. But, I, but now, once the Holy Spirit answers that prayer and the Holy Spirit equips you now, and you start to have a burning passion for the lost, you need knowledge too. You need some tools to actually be able to do the work. So let's just run through some of, of what, what's actually needed um, to, to properly Engage in relentless soul winning. We already know um, that we cannot do any of this, all that we've just been talking about, without the power of the Holy Spirit. And you see what Scripture says there in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Scripture says, But you will receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you. So we know that we need power, and the power that we need is the power of the Holy Spirit. So again, we got to engage the Holy Spirit. As I wake up every day, when I get out of my house and I know I'm going to a place where I will, where I will come across people, I'm gotta, I have to say, Holy Spirit, give me the power. Holy Spirit, activate the power in me to speak a word. Activate the boldness. Activate the confidence. Activate the grace, activate the wisdom, activate the knowledge, the understanding, the power to be able to speak a word in season to a person who may be lost out there in the world. The Holy Spirit's power is needed to do this work of soul winning. You also need to know the word, the word of God. 
You need to know the word of God. That is without question. You need to know the word of God. You need to know the truth of God. So you are not being tossed, you know, to and fro. You need to know the word of God. You need to understand what God's truth is. You need to know the key elements of who God is. And this is what you, 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 you get to know and understand as you engage in the study of the word of God. You get to actually have a clear picture. The God that you are going to present to people out there, do you actually understand him in truth, not in religion? Not in, re in religiosity, but do you know this God in truth? Before I go out to sell something, do I know the product? Before I go out to say, hey, come buy this, do I know the product? We are selling the truth of God. We are selling the redemption in Jesus. We need to fully understand it in our own lives first. So know the word of God. It is a necessary tool for soul winning. We've talked about compassion for the lost souls. Um, we also need to have faith. Scripture makes reference several times that what, where man counts impossibilities with God, nothing shall be impossible. Nothing shall be impossible. So when we go, when we have a heart to actually, you know, be a soul winner, we need to also carry that heart in mind that nothing is impossible. Nobody cannot be saved. Nobody cannot be saved. It is possible with God for the, the, the deepest, most wicked man on earth, most wicked woman on earth, the most demon-possessed person on earth to be saved. So do not write people off based on what you know about them. Do not write people off based on what you heard about them. Do not write people off based on their lifestyle. Jesus cast out from Mary Magdalene seven demons. He cast out from the, the other guy, you know, who they cast the, the, the demons, the legions, out from him into the pigs. There were 2,000 pigs, you know. There were 2,000 pigs in that man that those demons went into. So don't count impossibilities with God. With soul winning, no impossibility. Everybody, anybody can be saved by the mercy of God. Prayers is another key tool that we need to do this work. Engage in prayers. Engage in prayers. Be ready to also make personal sacrifices. Right? You, myself, we will need to make sacrifices. Personal sacrifices. Paul, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he talks about the fact that how, you know, to the Jew I became a Jew, to the Gentile I became a Gentile. I would have to let go of certain things. I would have to subject myself to certain things. We already know that, you know, from the book of Matthew 5, if I am going to be one who stands up for God, I will be persecuted. It's a given. If I'm going to be one who's out there evangelizing and, and trying to get the lost to be saved, I am going to be persecuted. There's no question about that. It's a known fact. So I have to be ready for those personal sacrifices as well. And then I have to be patient. And finally, whatever I am going out there and professing and asking others to do, I must be a, a living example of that word. I must be a living example of that life that I'm trying to get others into. Amen. So we've said a lot today. If there's anything to take away is the fact that we must keep in mind that soul winning is not just some other thing. It is a core pillar of our Christian life. It is something we should be totally devoted to all the time. All the time. We should ask the Holy Spirit for help and for power to do this on a consistent basis not to miss out on the opportunities. And we know that the Lord answers such prayers. Amen. So I wanted to just say a word of prayer 
bow your heads again and say, Father, as I go out this week, over the next seven days, I want to win a soul. I want to share the word of God. Give me opportunities to talk to a person about Jesus. Give me opportunities to represent Jesus. Give me opportunities this week, over the next seven days, to represent Christ, to engage the lost. I will look forward to the opportunities. In Jesus' name we pray.